during the financial crisis in Greece, Athenians saw their city changing rapidly. Shops, bars, restaurants kept closing. Downtown was gradually being deserted, and the city was kind of left to its own devices. Garbage was sometimes not collected, broken city lights not repaired, damaged pavement and streets were not fixed, abandoned buildings were falling apart. The lack of money and the lack of care for the city from official channels gave rise to subaltern groups that took matters to their own hands. Groups of volunteers took on initiatives aiming at cleaning and beautifying the city, providing amenities for the public good, such as the creation of small parks, uh, and advocating for a more people-oriented and environmental-friendly city. And I'm showing you here some images that I know uh, those of you who are living in Athens will recognize that these are some of the examples that these volunteer groups um, took over at Athens. Such initiatives were met mostly with enthusiasm by the public. Many people joined in, and images of transformed or reformed places went viral on social media and often broadcasted in the news. One might argue that such initiatives had very little impact on the actual architectural and spatial reorganization of the city, but they did become symbols of hope, even resistance, and above all, of, civ of civic engagement. The political dimensions of such actions, however, have gone largely unnoticed or less emphasized. And in fact, many of these initiatives had a very apolitical profile and, and stand as if somehow engaging with the city and intervening in its urban fabric can never be a politically neutral action. These volunteer-based social organizations were assuming the role of the state providing amenities, shaping public spaces, performing activities to benefit the public. When one such group decided to paint a public staircase in vibrant colors, as you see in your screen, there were negative reactions um, and people in that neighborhood questioned the right of the volunteers to interfere and transform in public spaces in their neighborhood without their consent. That question, who has the right to make choices and intervene, is a political question pertaining to authority, access, and public participation. Similar, similarly, the movements of tactical urbanism in the States, but also in some cities in Europe and Latin and South America, is reshaping public spaces, as well as the discourse in urban planning and the role of design in creating cities that advance social equality, mental health, and sustainability. Tactical urbanism, or guerrilla urbanism, includes flexible, low-cost, and short-term projects to advance long-term goals related to street safety, public space, and more. Tactical urbanism projects can be led by governments, nonprofits, grassroots groups, or frustrated citizens, but often they become a platform for people to take action and clearly and directly engage with local and state administrations about their needs and priorities. Whether such actions are perceived as acts of resistance, of criticism towards the government, or as a collaboration between citizen organizations and the state to manage a crisis, these are political actions, and they engage cities, states, and people in a political dialogue, even if they're not presented or advertised as such. They also highlight the wide range of activities, such as creating a biplane or painting a wall, small-scale and informal actions with political dimensions. My work deals with the life and material culture of ordinary people in Byzantium. In my research, I try to give a voice to non-elites and advocate for their agency and active role in the main political, economic, and social events of their times. Considering how much we rely on elite points point of view through the written works in Byzantine studies, and how in history at large is still written as the narrative of great actions of big men and their role in shaping the course of human destiny. Advocating for the importance of non-elites is not an easy task. They're not so easy to trace in the archeological record. And when we do find such evidence, these are mostly people's garbage and remains of structures that they built and used, thus making it a complicated process for us archaeologists to arrive at discussions of political action and civic participation 
with parts of a wall or a broken vessel as our starting point. I promise we do so with success, as you will see later, but I just want to emphasize here that this is a complex process. In a Byzantine urban context, cities are still considered products of imperial will and elite action, expressed through taxation, um, legislation, and acts of patronage. In my work, however, I seek a more holistic approach that also accounts for bottom-up actions by non-elites found in daily activities, which are usually seen as irrelevant to the empire's political life, but I hope that we will see that that's not the case, people's social interaction and shared experiences and spaces. In Byzantine studies, cities as political entities are synonymous to revolts, but very little work has been done about the social and economic mechanisms where political events could be planned, political views exchanged, and political actions unravel. For example, what kind of actions and social networks allow some people to gain enough social capital and respect among their fellow citizens to convince a large section of the city to revolt? Which spaces foster that kind of social interaction that allows such behaviors to come in fruition? Furthermore, from what we know on Byzantine provisional administration, the mode of operation in the provinces involved a hands-off central administration that did not intervene in the cities unless there was a visible threat to its authority. In that political environment, subaltern powers to control of the cities, provided for the infrastructure, decided on their day-to-day -day -day operations, and shaped their morphology. Whether these actions are understood as collaboration, coexistence, or competition between central administration, local authorities, and small-scale communities, they support the ideas that cities were to some degree self-regulated and enforced rules and acceptable behavior among their members. And I'm showing you here uh, some of the elite participants in city making, emperors themselves, although in the history of Byzantine Athens, only two emperors ever uh, visited the city. Basel II being one of them, um, imperial officials that had very short appointments and therefore had less invested interest in the well-being of the city, and ecclesiastical officials such as the very famous Michael Honiatis at Athens who show more interest in cities and they do participate in some major infrastructure works. However, in such a landscape of absence of a central administration, we want to account for all the players who participated in the city. Of course, the examples of modern Athens and the movement of tactical urbanism cannot describe nor explain how Byzantines dealt and organized their cities. We are talking about different political formations and societies with different belief systems and values. They are, however, useful in allowing us to imagine the range of possibilities and activities that might have taken place in Byzantium that would engage the participant of ordinary people in the architecture and spatial organization of their city. These modern movements also invite us to expand our definition of political behavior, not only in the present, but also in the past. They also highlight the role of daily activities that, although they center on social interaction and better conditions for urban life, they're also um, encouraging social coherence and collectiveness, enhance trust and group participation, and allow participants to gain social capital. All these are behaviors that can translate to political action and can be activate, activated to create bigger and more visible political events. In what follows, I discuss some finds from my work on Byzantine Athens. I rely primarily on the Athenian Agora excavations that since 1931 have brought to light a significant part of the Byzantine city, including hundreds of houses and a variety of other built and open spaces. So here I'm showing you uh, an aerial photo of the Agora and a photo that was taken in the first day of excavation in May 1931. And you can still see that there are houses, this is an area that's still inhabited full of houses at the moment that the excavation starts. This, this photo is just to show you the chaos of the Byzantine houses and structures that were actually underneath um, that area that's now known as the archaeological site. 
The majority of these Byzantine discoveries uh, still await publication, but I have decided to focus on this part of Athens due to the extent of the area excavated and the wealth and variety of Byzantine structures and artifacts discovered. These finds provide a unique opportunity to examine the political, economic, and social changes in Byzantium through the lens of its cities and bring into sharp focus the people who lived in and saved them. I should at this point confess that when I first started this project, overwhelmed by the volume and complexity of the data and of the many unknown factors about the operations of cities and their non-elite um, populations, Politics was the last thing on my mind. But as the first spaces of social interaction and collective activities among ordinary people started emerging, my work also turned to questions of political action and saved much of my research agenda. Therefore, the way that my project is designed now, it asks questions about city making and city makers in Byzantine Athens. It focuses on search spaces, experiences, and responsibilities as pathways of citizen participation in the shaping and governing of their cities. Moving beyond an economic model that emphasizes economic activities such as agricultural production, manufacture, and taxation, I look at other factors that shape the urban fabric, such as daily activities, collective memory, and performance of group identity. Turning to the groups and individuals who participate in such city-making processes, I explore the conditions under which they created and managed urban spaces and discuss how such actions informed Athenians' collective identity and political behavior. Now, before I take you uh, on a little tour in Byzantine Athens, permit me a word on the methodology of my project and the challenges in working with the material from such a large scale and long standing archaeological project. Now, I study the material from the early decades of the excavation, which are invaluable for the understanding um, of the city, but they're also a product of early recording methods. Thus, I deal with what we call in archaeology legacy data. That means non machine readable information found in excavation handwritten notebooks that you see on your screen, all photos and card catalogs, drawings and plans that are not digitized and certainly not georeferenced, a huge amount of artifacts that need to be restudied and redated, as you see me doing in that photo, um, since much has changed in the chronology front. All of these challenges have to be acknowledged and resolved before any further uh, action is taken. So you might now uh, forgive my initial indifference in asking about the political behavior of Byzant Byzantine Athenians, as I was a little bit preoccupied with how to digitize, reorganize, and reevaluate all these data um, to prepare them for further study and analysis. The best way I can show you some of my findings is to invite you to follow the story of one specific Byzantine street in the Athenian Agora. So we are going to focus in this area here that is actually north uh, of the Festion and north of the train tracks as well. So here we studied uh, with my team an entire uh, Byzantine neighborhood and its buildings and activities between the 11th and 13th century. And we looked at evidence of social in interaction and served responsibility. Now, this small street road that you see here runs uh, north-south and separates these uh, two house blocks on the road's left and right. The street was initially wider, and you can see it here. It was wider on the north, uh, but became irregular and narrower to the south. Within the street, a foundation for a gate was discovered that was uh, placed east-west extending from the one house facade to the opposite one, just blocking the road. I also want to show you, and here I'm showing you, again, the same uh, photo with all its elements, the road, the, extent, the um, houses and their uh, walls, as well as the foundations of the gate for you to understand the spatial arrangement of, of these finds. I also want to show you this photo um, that is from the early modern um, 
city of Athens, and this is located again in the Athenian Agora, uh, that you kind of see the same arrangement here. Um, we have a gate running from one house, external facade to the other. Um, and you can see here that not only does this gate block access to the rest of the street, but it functions as a visual market, marker to prevent you from going towards that direction. Now, coming back to, the, to our Byzantine houses, after a destructive fire in the first half of the 12th century that destroyed parts of both houses, their facades were completely rebuilt. The new external wall of the West House, you see here, um, was completely rebuilt and it went back towards the interior of the house. So as a result, the street now became wider also to the, to the south. The gate itself was abandoned and never rebuilt. To help you appreciate a little bit more how that change would have felt for the Byzantine Athenians, I also want to share with you. So here, for example, you see um, the before and after the pre-fire phase and the post-fire phase, just for you to see the, the changes in the street. But I also want to show you this uh, virtual reality model I did with my students at UVA. Uh, we just wanted to know a little bit, to immerse ourselves in this environment and understand better how um, that gate would look like in the street. So here you see the gate coming from the north, moving to the, to the south. Uh, and here you see again the pre-fire phase with the gate and the post-fire phase without the gate. Now, my students and I, while we're walking in both within uh, the street and testing the two scenarios, uh, we all agreed that it felt more inviting without the gate, as you can see yourselves. Uh, the experience was more pleasant, and we all noted that we were able to see parts of the cities emerging in the background. In other ways, we, we realized that the gate really shaped the way we understood our surrounding spaces, as uh, space through our bodies and senses, and impacted our movement. Now, I believe that this gated street points to an arrangement involving the residents of the street. We have no way of knowing what kind of arrangement this was or why the gate was abandoned after the fire. One can entertain different possibilities, from complaints and threats of legal action by other people in the neighborhood, to new owners coming to this house, simply indifference. Regardless, the implementation and destruction of the gate that regulated movement and controlled accessibility are material manifestations of interaction and political practice at the neighborhood level that does not belong to the local administration. What happened in this street certainly affected the streets uh, nearby, the houses nearby, uh, and also the people's movement in the broader area since this street continues both to the north and to the south. Whether this gate was something that neighbors agreed upon or contested, their shared space um, and frequent interna interaction here forced them to consider what was public and private and negotiate issues of right of property and access. Such interactions among, na among neighbors pertaining to the regulation of public spaces had significant political implications in the life of the city. I want to remain in the same street so I can show you another way uh, in which citizens interacted. During the excavation of this uh, the eastern house, the archaeologists brought to light a cesspit that was associated with the house and located outside it below the street surface. As you see from this drawing, uh, what we have here is a pipe piercing the exterior wall of the house and the pipe would transport the collected dirty waters and waste from inside the house to the cesspit outside. Since there were no public services for collecting and removing waste, this responsibility fell on the individuals occupying the house. In the case where the pit was not emptied on time, the waste would overflow and spill on the street. One of the factors that prevented this from happening was the surrounding houses and the reaction of the people in the neighborhood, including those crossing the street on a daily basis. Thus, this humble structure points to social interaction and citizen engagement in regulating not only public spaces, but people's behavior in public space. Collective action and citizen responsibilities were informed by social norms and values 
and the first to reinforce them and police appropriate behavior was not the state, was not the local administration, but the people who lived and interacted with each other on a daily basis and felt the consequences of each other's choices and actions in an immediate and direct way. These, of course, are just only a couple of examples from a vast number of spaces and objects that speak to political action and citizen engagement in Byzantine Athens. The cleaning and reworking of Roman wells in the middle of small streets and alleys, and the transformation of tiny spaces between house, houses in places of burial, prayer, and ritual that serve the local communities are some of the other phenomena witnessed in cities. The examples from the Athenian Agora that I have presented here point to spaces and activities that offer opportunities for collective action and experiences and enhance social affili affiliations and court in specific locales. They also all involve the active participation of the residents themselves in transforming urban spaces through daily action, changes in architecture and its use, and embedded social meanings. For example, in the case of the gated rope that we saw, the spatial arrangement defined acceptable behavior by introducing a barrier that controlled movement and functioned as a means of negotiating notions of public and private. This active involvement in city making process suggests that different social groups, including the residents themselves, assume some of the state's fundamental roles as city builders and providers of amenities, at least at the neighborhood level. These activities and search spaces speak to collective action, which is inherent, inherently political. They reflect and reaffirm aspects of collective identity and exemplify how cities could function as a collective and political body. They also point to city self-regulation um, and the relationship of the governed with the local and central administration. As such, even the story of a small street allows us to study the political and social mechanisms of an empire even in the micro scale, and offer alternative narratives about city making that are not limited to public and monumental structures, and they're not centered only on institutions. Finally, similarly to tactical urbanism in the US and grassroots initiatives pertaining to urban transformation at modern Athens, these examples from the Athenian Agora afford new opportunities for expanding our definition of political action and re reinstate all political actors, including non-elites, in the historical narrative. And this I'm just showing to show all our, thank all our sponsors and university that supports our work, and also to thank you uh, for listening.